Uh, hi, Aya. It's very good hi, to Anna. be today with me. Finally, on this show, we have an eco-designer, environmental designer, who is also, by some miracle of fate, is my regular listener, and that's how we connected. Super excited, super happy to hear from you today. The topic we will uncover is your professional stream, is your professional uh, choice, is design. Design for environment, in, environmental design, furniture, right? Yes. Hi, Anna. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of the podcast. Uh, and I thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to share actually my experience because I think it's something uh, relatively new uh, to, to, to have this claim of uh, environmental designer. But I will explain a little bit further the, my um, experience in furniture, but a disclaimer, design can be applied to anything, whether it's a product or a service. Right. Because, uh, because of uh, well, my training, and I think most of the designers who are trained, they are the way, the way how we uh, do things, it's very similar. So it's just a matter of a certain uh, uh, putting it in context, but uh, the process are pretty much similar. How did you start? Was it a calling or was it a choice? It's the first time I am talking to a real life designer, honestly, <laughs> especially in the environmental sphere. And I'm very curious to know how did you, how did you step on the path of sustainability? Well, I, I would start with uh, my origins, perhaps, um, as also it, uh, it's, it's, uh, Let's say it's a miracle, it's a surprise for both of us perhaps that uh, we are all coming from the post-Sovietic uh, uh, countries, we, we are all both from the post-Sovietic countries, so I think, oh, I'll be speaking for myself, but maybe you can also relate that uh, in our families, without knowing that, we already have been practicing um, certain habits that are actually now uh, reviving, returning in the occidental world. Uh, the, the reuse of uh, packaging, the use of uh, products uh, for a very long time, the, the act of uh, repairing stuff. It was always uh, something that was uh, valued in, in my family. And I think it was unconsciously uh, building up the way how I think, how my family thinks, that eventually respond to the uh, issues that are now very uh, well um, um, publicized. Like, yeah. Now everyone is, talk is talking about that, how we can <clears throat> prevent um, environmental um, impacts with our small acts of, uh, of a lifestyle. So it's something that was already inside me, but uh, initially, my background, my, my family, we never had designers. We didn't even uh, have uh, relatives related to design sphere or art. And um, except my grandfather, he was actually an engineer. And uh, the way why I say that is because I actually was curious about design. It was something that very new for me and with the uh, huge wave of uh, this uh, access to information, the technology development at the beginning of 2000s, um, it actually really shaped me. Before that, I didn't even think of what I wanted to do. So uh, thanks to this advances of technology, I could start my own research uh, and uh, realize, oh, that looks interesting, so maybe I should start here. It's different from what others are doing because obviously when you have uh, your life, in my case, uh, seeing the typical professions as a um, lawyer, uh, economist, you know, economist, yes. <laughs> uh, there, there were no actually um, bigger choice, so you end up being bored and not really interested in that. And uh, that was the reason why I uh, decided to pursue my higher education abroad, because um, the universities do offer you a bigger um, variety. <laughs> uh, the, 
the, the, so, so the universities abroad, they do offer you a wider choice, a wider range of uh, different uh, uh, faculties. So I was really interested in uh, actually design rather than, let's say for me, design is more of a, uh, it's not the same as art, but ironically, I entered uh, my uh, first year at school as art direction and advertising. So it was something more of an applied design uh, field, but, but eventually I was actually disappointed, to be honest, because I started to understand, well, working for consumerism is something not really ethical. <laughs> and I'm not saying that personal to anyone who is in the advertising field, because they definitely have a huge responsibility to um, uh, grow the economy. But at the same time, I think it's about time to do it of, of more ethical and more conscious manner. Um, so then I decided to change my career. So in having some basis of design, I uh, was also uh, thinking that uh, maybe I should do much more technical thing that is very related to design, but it definitely will give me a better depth of knowledge and it will be much more uh, applicable in, on, in the long run. So my grandfather actually was an engineer, which was a mining engineer. So it was also a tribute to a family to continue engineering paths. And to my surprise and to my luck, um, they, I found this program, which is uh, called uh, Engineering and Industrial Design and Product Development. And I um, actually studied in Barcelona at uh, National University, it's called the Universidad Politecnica de Catalunya. So it's a public university. Also for those who are probably not familiar with the educational system abroad, it's quite difficult to get to the public universities. <laughs> Which are studying? Sorry? What's the language of studying? Uh, the language of studying actually in Barcelona, that's a very good question, it's Catalan. And uh, also for me, it's uh, when, I, when I was uh, choosing a country, I was also obviously hoping to do something in the language I already know, so maybe English, but I decided to do this, to accept this challenge and to learn two languages <laughs> at the same time when uh, obtaining uh, the career, the engineering uh, career, uh, so the, the degree. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn uh, in Spanish and uh, Catalan to, to get uh, to the university. Um, so, I think also when, when you are placed in the environment, it's definitely much easier if, and faster to, to uh, obtain this uh, knowledge. And uh, the, obviously you're not doing it alone, so you do have classmates at the university. It's also helping you to uh, advance in, in this learning path. So um, basically during this uh, university years, uh, it was, I must say, it was at the beginning quite uh, confusing. What exactly are we doing? <laughs> Is it we are designing products? Is it that we can help produce the products or in a technical manner, in, in a line of production? Or is it that we are developing products to put them on the market? So eventually, my career actually helps me to, it, it, it gives me opportunity to do anything of, of this uh, product development s steps, yes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's, uh, I think at, at the second year of university, I realized, damn, this is a, this is a great uh, choice I did. And, I was, and I'm still very proud of the choice I did because it really gives me um, the cards, uh, the, the open doors for me to get in any stage of production process. Of, of development process. And uh, like I said earlier, the, the, the way how we think, the way how we train to think, it helps you to get, um, uh, to adapt quicker to any environment. So depending on, on, the, on the context you are in, it's, uh, it's just a matter of a couple of weeks to get into the topic and you are, you are, you are un able to understand how the, structure work, how the system works. And um, so by the end of the, my university studies, I was uh, exposed to this opportunity to participate in a research program that was uh, held at my university, 
which is called uh, circular design, um, learning for innovative design for sustainability um, research um, that was funded by Erasmus Plus. And my university was the leader of this research. It was an international research between four countries. I and uh, <laughs> I, I will also add uh, the link so um, yeah. people can check uh, what is it about mm -hmm. because um, uh, I think it's a great start for me. It was it was a huge opportunity for me to actually learn more about sustainability. It's actually I can say it was one of the first conscious steps towards um, sustainability in design. And uh, so I was uh, participating as a student for, to develop my thesis, which uh, we did in, in Ireland, actually, because one of the participating universities was the University of Limerick. So our project was based on solving local, local problems. In my case, uh, me and my class, um, not classmates, because we are all representatives of four different universities, so it was also a different situation where you are exposed to new people that you've never seen before yeah. <laughs> and, you, and you need to learn and you need to learn uh, to adapt quickly and actually in a very short period of time to um, find a solution for a stated problem. And in our case, uh, we were very lucky with our team. I'm very proud of my team because we, I think we did a great job. Um, we were... Um, challenged with the uh, fish nets. The fish nets uh, that are being discarded at uh, Irish ports, and especially the problem was with ghost nets. I don't know if you know about them, but uh, Ireland is one of, for Ireland, one of the most important industry in economy is uh, fishing. So the residue that uh, Irish fishermen have is, is the fishing nets and in many cases, in most of the cases, the most accessible ones are made of plastic. Yeah. And, uh, and as we know, plastic and uh, water are not a really good friends <laughs> because they harm. They harm the, the, the ecosystem of, of, uh, of the water, of the oceans, of the, of the animals. And we definitely uh, saw all those uh, traumatic images of animal suffering. And uh, we all already know that plastic is taking ages, centuries to, to degrade. And uh, it is a huge problem, actually. It's still um, a, a, in the process of solving. There is no uh, unanimous solution. And there's actually ongoing research project from um, different universities, uh, not, not in this case from our university, but other specifically focused on the protection of uh, oceans. Yeah. So in our case, we were uh, paired with a small business that is actually trying to help the situation and repurpose the discarded fish in it into new product. And what was That's it? Just... What was this new product? <laughs> <laughs> so in, in our case, we did what we, what we actually did is, is we designed um, a sort of a system that will help the company to transform it into products. It's, it means that we would uh, in, involve uh, fishermen to help recollect uh, the, the nets. Uh, we would, the idea is to create um, work for those uh, who are unemployed to help cleaning those fishing nets because it's also a big problem with, uh, with discarded used nets. They are smell like fish <laughs> and it's not very pleasant. Uh, and uh, eventually um, we proposed a list of different uh, uh, tools to help the small enterprise. That being said, is low budget to use uh, certain tools to um, recycle these nets into products for that they are already using. For example, uh, they, they produce actually the bags out of uh, the, how do you say it? The bags from um, sailcloth, from the old ships. So they, they use that. And also they introduce uh, nets 
as a part of a decorative uh, um, solution. In our case, we, we also uh, designed a mold to do a new fishing net needle. It is a tool to, to help the fishermen to repair the needles. So it was also um, a way to introduce and show to the fishermen that actually the discarded fishing nets can be very useful, <laughs> especially for them. So thanks to this program, I think what we developed, all of us who participated in this uh, uh, project, we developed a um, way of thinking, a system thinking. So it's not only just uh, solve a solution to redesign a certain product, but think of all the system, all, all the stakeholders, all the stages of life cycle of this product or material um, that can help, that can be improved, they can uh, they consider the, the impact that it can make on the long run. So I think it, it definitely shapes the way you think, uh, this type of uh, methodology. And that's why I'm really uh, saying it uh, was an enriching opportunity. And eventually I actually started to, to participate in this project and I was uh, helping to, uh, uh, in, at, at university uh, to, to, to continue doing this project. Um, the, best, so, the best I think is that created, that's the part I love the most, is, it, is that probably it created the sense of ownership. All those stakeholders of the idea fishermen are engaged they know and they will see the result of their work so they do it they are motivated they they want to do it uh, the buyers the service the clients and so on everybody sees how their part is influencing the end result and uh, yeah the sense of ownership is extremely important when you recall exactly yeah, uh, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. The, the sense of ownership, the sense of responsibility uh, is uh, very important to nurture in uh, each person because it definitely changes the way how, how we think, how we, uh, um, how we act, what, how, how we take decisions. Yeah, totally. When you recalled the, you know, the earlier years of the of life in Kazakhstan, eh, it almost brought tears to my eyes. Now I'm always going to the supermarket with what is called uh, the spider bag, a voice And I remember when I was little, my, we had a this spider bag at home and my grandma would take me with him to the open market. And as a little kid, I remember asking myself the question, why does everyone need to see what we bought? <laughs> I didn't want any exposure. Like, why do they have to know that we bought potatoes or, or greenery or whatever? So I remember that. And one of the most, the brightest memories is my grandma washing uh, plastic bags, big, uh, solid, like kind of very, uh, do solid uh, plastic bags in the bathtub to reuse them again and they would lose the color and the picture uh, on both sides and then when she would send my my aunt who was 11 years younger than me to to the market or somewhere to the shop she would be embarrassed she's still embarrassed by those plastic bags in her memory that oh my god people will see this uh, ugly looking washed plastic bags but we were doing that you know we were doing that and at some Absolutely. point it just became oh it's fine let's just throw everything away you collect and collect and collect them until a certain point until all the cupboard is filled with these damn plastic bags that you hope to reuse someday for for garbage or something and it gets thrown away so i think we got this um easy solution at some point by the way i learned recently very recently i learned that plastic uh, emerged as uh, a response to activist push to cut down on uh, paper bags to cut down on logging 
And so ages ago, plastic was really seen as a, as a miracle, as a great solution, as the best solution. Now mm -hmm. we are going, you see the spiraling, going back to paper, but no, we don't want paper. We want something more and more yeah, durable. More usable. It's it's funny you mentioned that because it's it's uh, I didn't I didn't know about this uh, activist solution, but um, I think plastic this this huge paranoia about plastic being so bad I think it's not really justified because eventually the problem is one use like single use plastic, not not the plastic itself. Plastic is actually a really interesting material. It's, uh, it definitely helped us to do uh, a lot of technological advances. Um, but but uh, the, I think the issue here, it was uh, the, the design. Uh, and uh, actually one of the, the founders of the Institute of Cradle to Cradle, uh, William McDonough, mentioned that in his uh, book of upcycling that the problem, uh, the environmental problem is, that we have is actually that is, is a design problem. It's uh, so referring to plastic, it was the, the problem that someone s didn't think of the, the consequences it can have, yeah. it will have, um, bringing plastic material to something that is not supposed to be durable and it's not supposed to last long and uh, has, a, has a huge uh, period of uses, it can damage the material itself and shred it. Because back then, I think it, it was not even considered to be uh, part of the thinking process. And, um, and I think uh, I, I, I do understand that the, the issue is a plastic free future. And it's true that uh, the, most of the plastics that, we, that are commercially available now are based on petroleum. But there are there are a lot of new plastics that are based on um, natural materials such as uh, wood or uh, cotton. Mm -hmm. There are we we are advanced uh, technologically to achieve this type of uh, renewable uh, materials, and I think that is, this is brilliant. But that's once again thanks to our uh, involvement and our continuous research. And uh, yeah, I think that that's, uh, definitely gives a promise for a better free future. <laughs> totally. For you, design is art or science? I think it's uh, on the edge of uh, both. It's, uh, it's, um, it's a question that many designers and people ask in general. What is design? Is it art? And for me, when I hear that something is, made, is designed, designer piece or designer product for me it just doesn't make any sense because anything that you own is designed <laughs> design itself it's a process it's a process of bringing an idea to uh, a tangible or intangible product and it's uh, it's uh, it's a huge flock of communication whoever whoever thought it was a good idea it definitely uh, under undermines the, the actual value of design and uh, for me the, the design is it's the mixture of uh, both best parts of both of science and uh, and art so eventually it's engineering engineering yeah. <laughs> comfort or aesthetics that's a good question i think our, as a designer, our goal is to get the uh, balance of both because uh, aesthetics is also uh, sort of a function of uh, emotional pleasure and uh, maybe it's not considered as such but I do understand that it is, uh, it does reflect and it does uh, respond to our need for um, visual pleasure, um, tactical pleasure, and it's uh, important to add it. It's not an extra, it's not something to, to, to sell, it's not a tool to do better marketing, it's something to respond to the needs of human being, because we do have uh, 
we do react to visual stuff much more easily. And uh, that is important uh, thing to take into account when design things like this. Yeah. Design for sustainability. Your focus now is in furniture or design of something else? At the moment, yes, we are, I am focused on furniture design. Mm -hmm. But it also, it's well, the whole experience uh, starting to design a furniture uh, is, was actually very new to me. But it was a, a great start to implement all this knowledge that I've been collecting on uh, environmental design on, with all the eco design tools that I've learned and I practiced uh, during my uh, participation in the research program. Uh, it became a good base to actually apply all this in, uh, in, a, in a furniture uh, field. And um, actually we were working, I was uh, invited to, to, to this job uh, because um, the company, the, the studio where I work right now at, in Barcelona, it's a dear design studio. It's a, actually an award winning uh, studio that uh, develops uh, interior solutions, interior space design and products. So um, for the, since the past two years, they uh, decided to, they teamed up with another company, with a new company firm in, from Paris, to create um, eco-design, eco-conscious uh, collection of furniture for offices. So uh, I was really excited about this because um, when I hear offices, uh, when I hear something that is related to general public, uh, if you asked me two years ago, I probably would not consider that, but now uh, it means certifications. <laughs> It means, it means all those it means all those restrictions that it, the furniture has to um, respond not only the on, on, on the level of functionality and ergonomics but also um, on the level of uh, general well-being of the users and uh, and obviously the well-being of the environment I, I think there is one big issue to add there um to pour some oil in the fire is the health and safety. Absolutely. I Absolutely, because, because the, the, this type of furniture use, is usually placed in, um, in the spaces, in the public spaces, and uh, it has to be, uh, it, ha it has to, it, all the materials that we, that we use, they, they need to be considered uh, for the, their flammability, their durability, um, and uh, that was uh, actually for us was a good challenge. <laughs> yeah. How is design with sustainability in mind different from design per se in its conventional, conventional mm -hmm. form? So how is design for sustainability is different from design for, for just design? <laughs> Well, design, like, like I said, uh, it's a complex process of planning and execution, an idea, and uh, it can be applied to any field. So for me, personally, I think sustainable design, it's not only applied to physical products, but it also can be applied to services. Uh, and the biggest difference is that it uh, takes in consideration when you are outlining the first idea or redesigning something, you take into consideration the uh, possibility of uh, preserving our resources and ensuring the availability of the resources for future generations. Um, it's, uh, it takes into account the, the, all those environmental impacts that product or service will have mm -hmm. at, eight, at each stage of its life cycle. That being said, it means that uh, when, when, we need, when we design a product or service, we need to project ourselves in a long term um, in, in the, to think each step of the product uh, uh, use cycle also. So I think that's, that's the main difference uh, between conventional design and sustainable design that sometimes or most of the time, conventional design is mo mostly focused on users, but sustainable design 
just adds the environmental and not as an, an annex, but actually is based on the well-being of uh, users and sustainable and, and environment. Yeah, so it's at the core instead of on the edge. Exactly. Exactly. That's well said. <laughs> that, does it mean um, recyclable materials? I don't know, like bamboo or uh, materials that will serve longer? The furniture that you are producing, how, how, in which way is it different from anything else that surrounds me, for example, in my room? In, in our case, in the project that uh, I've been working on with uh, Deer Design and Fern, um, our main focus was materials, actually. Uh, our, our challenge, we, we set ourselves a challenge to join two different types of materials, which are recycled materials and upcycled materials, and uh, into one object. And in this case, for example, um, the, we, we designed an office desk that does have upcycled uh, wood from uh, old uh, trains uh, and uh, the recycled uh, plastic. Wow. And uh, our process of designing uh, this, this the furniture was that uh, it is easy to disassemble and each piece can be uh, either reused or um, repurposed for something else or recycled. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the eco-design tools actually that uh, help uh, designers to focus, to, to be more conscious of the um, environmental impacts design can have. Some of them are, for example, the monomaterial that the, or the modularity of the, of the product. Those are very uh, um, good approaches. Those are one of the approaches to, uh, to achieve this step to design products that are respectful with our environment. Right. And the material choices is one of the most important uh, for me, I think, because uh, uh, in, 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 design, in design of furniture, it has to respond to multitude of uh, issues. And uh, I, th I think with uh, our collection, we managed to do this, uh, considering it was our actually first experience for most of us. <laughs> It's, it is. It was. It is a big step. It is a huge step uh, towards a more sustainable products. And obviously, uh, our goal now is to improve, not only in the design but also in the whole um, process of production, the, the supply chain, the, the management of end of life of product. Uh, these are the stages that we are considering. In, uh, in, impro in improving our products and services. When you said it's, it should, the furniture, the desk was easy to disassemble, it reminded me the big problem with our modern smartphones is that you cannot just simply take out the battery and change the battery and keep using the, uh, the product, the piece as a whole. Yes. This is something uh, I hope will, will be going towards changing. Another thing I wanted to ask you, do you think take back systems for furniture specifically, something for us to see in the future in terms of circular economy and closed loops? I've never seen it before, honestly. If there is a piece of furniture that I'm, I'm not using it anymore, I think I would pass it on to, I don't know, to friends, to some young families or mm -hmm. you know, have a lot of uh, internally displaced people in the country due to the, the conflict in the East. I'm, I'm talking and I'm thinking that I am actually that person. <laughs> I was born there, I even have a paper. <laughs> uh, yeah, so these uh, display, internally displaced people, of course, they, they knew the furniture and everything. But if I want to give it to some specific 
organization or atelier, I would call it an mm -hmm. atelier, to repurpose it, to redo, to upcycle, to take uh, pieces of, of the wood out of the pieces of the metal and do something new. Mm -hmm. and, and give additional value to really like up, upcycle. I don't see, I don't see anything around me. And I've never seen it anywhere in the world, honestly. Uh, I think it's something relatively new because, uh, um, well, from, from, from my knowledge, I, I discovered that in France, for example, there are services that are focusing on um, taking some furniture, used and unwanted furniture, for their, and then they, they keep it for their facilities for the further recycling or upcycling. And uh, it's uh, temp for me it is a reference because I it's true I myself uh, the only um, entities that are taking this responsibility are usually our government uh, entities such as waste management uh, companies and uh, and I think it also depends on the legislation of, uh, of where your furniture is where you are because uh, each country has their own um, policies for waste management. Because at this point, when, when we talk about the take-back system, uh, unfortunately, it, in many cases, it's, it is considered as a waste. And actually, the goal of uh, this new economical model, the circular economy, uh, is to get rid of this concept of waste and treat it as a resource. And I think... Um, so in this case, the, the French uh, entity um, has this uh, service of taking it back and not throwing to the landfill, but um, giving this opportunity for other small and medium enterprises to take advantage of this material. Um, I don't know, and if someone else knows from your listeners, I would really happy to, to know if uh, in your country uh, you do have similar companies or entities that are taking these services uh, and, and they are offering the services. But uh, I know that some, sometimes, in theory, in theory, the take-back system um, applied in furniture, it's definitely uh, something that can be possible, but it, def it requires a lot of, uh, um, it requires a, a total change of your uh, business model. And, uh, on the other side, I think this uh, approach is also very beneficial for the community because to take back cis, to take back the furniture or any product, it means that you need a certain um, logistic team. You yeah. need uh, the space for storage. You need the team for preparing this uh, product for further use. Mm -hmm. cleaning, maintenance. So while I'm talking, we can imagine that those, all of these are actually employment places. So this is another way of uh, uh, the, the beneficial part of uh, the circular economy is to create um, jobs and uh, help to develop a much more uh, stable society. And um, Examples of uh, this business model with the take-back system is one of the promising uh, addition to, to uh, current business, yeah. current, uh, to the companies that are, are producing furniture. I think it would be really interesting. But at the same time, it's very difficult uh, for me. I see, I, I see it's quite difficult to collaborate with, uh, especially when you are standing the, your, your products abroad when you are on international market it's quite difficult to control if your products are being well recycled well managed in terms of uh, basically avoiding them ending up into the, in the landfill but this workshop atelier that you describe it's it's a great example of local economy is like this concept of donut economy. And if you remember, there was an episode with Cleona, also from mm -hmm. Spain, about circular economy. Again, I don't know if it was in the episode or in our discussion before or after, 
but she said uh, there was some factory in Spain that didn't have enough uh, jobs, uh, enough um, kind of production rolling. Uh, so they mm-hmm. were like half work and half not. Uh, because China, because uh, buying in China was much cheaper than COVID hit. Uh, disruption of um, supply chains happened. They completely repurposed. Yeah, they, they were like, they had the production lines, but then they had to repurpose. The government not only promised them that they will buy, they helped them to restart their processes. And they were like, yeah, why, why in the first place we were even buying from China when now during this extreme crisis, Spain was hit very hard. Mm-hmm. It still is very, very hit by uh, coronavirus. We have people employed, we have our products produced here, we cut down on CO2 emissions, on transport, on logistics, on so many things, and we are benefiting from keeping it to ourselves. I think if, if there is like creation of jobs because of uh, this workshop, atelier, or furniture repair, that's uh, for the benefit of all. And it's- Absolutely. Also- Absolutely. And of course, the period of uh, circular economy. Yeah, I think like for, for me, um, it was one of the questions uh, when I was uh, in the defense of my thesis, one of the professors asked me, do you actually believe in circular economy? And I said, yes, of course I do, because I think that, that, that's why I actually want to do it. That's, that's why I, I, I am dedicating my uh, uh, career and my, my career path to this, because I think it's, uh, in theory, and I think it's already um, justified with the certain case studies around the world. In Europe, there are many case studies of these um, companies that are, that are basing their business model on circular economy. Uh, it shows that it is possible. The, obviously, it will be taking a long time to, to readjust. But like we said, step by step, each each uh, decision, each uh, action we are doing matters, and, yeah. and it definitely brings that a step closer to this uh, uh, change. Totally. And and uh, talking about the local production, it's uh, something that I would like to also highlight because for in in our uh, in our case when we were designing uh, our first collection of furniture it was really important uh, the production of it so we all the production is local it's um, all made in europe and uh, with 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 uh, suppliers from europe with uh, certified materials and uh, it was a huge uh, step for us to uh, prove that hey it is possible you just need to apply a little bit of effort <laughs> and, and move forward yeah, and just take it, uh, take it in a, as an experiment with a lot, a, a bit of adventureness and joy. Oh, but discovery, sense of discovery. What is there uh, around where I live? Maybe there is some a hidden and forgotten master, or wood master that uh, can help me out with something. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Are there any principles? craved in stone or wood uh, for uh, eco-design? Or it's like Um, learn on the go? I think one of the, well, especially for the people who are just trying to understand what is uh, eco-design and how is it related to circular economy, uh, I would definitely recommend uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. I think it was mentioned many times in your podcast. (laughs) It is still uh, a, a reference. And uh, and uh, the they did this uh, set of uh, data of the resources for uh, helping academia students and the industry to start doing these uh, changes in the way how they work, uh, and it's called the Circular Design Guide. Mm-hmm. I also will give you the. The link to this, it's uh, open source, it is, uh, it is available to public. And also, uh, it definitely worth to mention that the project that where I was participating, 
in, uh, at my university, the circular design, um, one of the objectives of this research project was to create uh, another database of the open resources, open educational resources. And I definitely recommend uh, to check it. It is available and it's very well sorted for different types of uh, users, whether you're a first timer or you're actually having a business and you want to learn um, your first step or what to do with it, how to change it. And uh, it's a very good resource to, to freely available yeah. uh, for those who need. So to summarize, I would like to mention quickly some of the main tools in eco design that are personally, I, I am really interested in those. It says, uh, um, those, those are basically based on the responding of principles of circular economy as of durability, just reusable, uh, reusable design, uh, or the design that is um, focused on repairability, like you, like you mentioned, yeah. uh, the product that can be repaired, yes, uh, that, that are fighting the programmed obsolescence, and uh, modularity, that's there, can, they can go hand in hand because it would mean that um, in a product, it, it is constructed of different modules and they are independent, so they can actually be replaced. One of the great examples is uh, of a mobile phone that is based on those principles is a uh, Fair phone, the Dutch uh, company. Um, also, I, I am really interested and I'm, I'm continuing learning. It is also very important to say that uh, as, a, as a designer in the focus on sustainability, every day is, is learning. You learn a lot of things and it is uh, important to systematically invest time and your mind to accept more information. So for me, uh, this field is really interesting. It's uh, um, organic materials, uh, the, the new composite materials uh, that are biodegradable or bio-based. And uh, this is new, some, some of the, oh, it's not new, it's new for me. <laughs> Uh -huh. uh, because I, I, I don't, I, don't uh, I did not have a direct experience, I did not have any um, projects related to that, but it's a really interesting topic, it's a really interesting field, and uh, there is a lot of experimentation going on, and um, it's definitely a huge, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of resources on, on that, because every day you see people that are starting to experiment to see how they can uh, improve the materials that are already in use, how they can be replaced. For example, there is a company in, um, they, they, uh, in comp the company that is uh, actually making leather out of uh, pineapple uh, or, or other companies that are making um, new material with uh, mushrooms. With I was the, just, just thinking today about uh, clothing. I was doing this house chores and I was like, it would be nice to buy at least one biodegradable piece of clothes, garment, because some, I, I, I wear my clothing for a very long time and I wear them until the point where it becomes the house wear. So, and I have mm -hmm. lots of that. I have no idea what to do with all of that. It's, to, you know, to the point where it's too old to give it to someone for free and impossible mm -hmm. to sell. So what do you do mm -hmm. with that? But of course you get tired of the same clothes sooner or later. For me, I, I do shopping honestly, maybe once every five years. Um, mm -hmm. Unless I'm varying in shape. <laughs> and wait <laughs> usually five years is my um, my quota but how nice would it be to have a biodegradable t-shirt made of pineapple that you wear for two three seasons and then it becomes organic uh, organic waste that just goes mm -hmm. it can be composted you can, you, compost. you can actually compost it in your garden that would be amazing yes and, and actually I, I 
won't be able to tell you exactly the, the names, but I do know, I'm aware of that, there are a lot of uh, investigation in that, in that sense, because actually one of the most polluting industry is fashion. Yeah. You mentioned the certification, uh, and it really connects in my mind with fashion, because I, I interviewed your, in a way, your colleague from Sustainable Fashion, also from Spain, also from Barcelona, uh, <laughs> Sherakovsky, from, um, she's a circular fashion consultant. And she also mentioned the pineapple leather and the certification named Cradle to Cradle. Is it the same for the furniture? What kind of varieties in certifications are there? Are there a lot? Are there conflicting? Cradle to Cradle certification is actually um, relatively new. I think it was uh, the Institute for Cradle to Cradle products was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, was uh, founded in 2008-2010 by uh, William McDonald who uh, who is actually an arch architect and an activist uh, and uh, i would re i also recommend to read his books that uh, the cradle to cradle and uh, and the upcycle that they really did those these books actually help to understand why uh, it is important uh, the design for sustainability because actually 80 percent of uh, the environmental impact is, this, is decided at the stage of design. It is uh, um, data that is uh, publicly um, available uh, and it, um, it is based on the research done by European Union. So that being said, the design is, is having a crucial role in uh, sustainable development. So one of the um, way to, uh, let's say, to make it, uh, to justify if your product is um, responding to those uh, issues, to water use, to a renewable energy use, to uh, the materials that are environmentally friendly. Uh, at the moment, it can be justified with a third party entity, such as the Cradle to Cradle Institute, uh, and they do have uh, available um, library of online of products uh, that are certified and it's not only applied for fashion it can be applied to the products to household products to furniture to uh, uh, finishings and uh, materials the, the construction materials so it's a, it has a really wide range of uh, products for certification and it has uh, different levels of certification as well and um, it is a, one of the most, uh, I would say, um, referenced and uh, becoming to one of the most known certification around the globe. Uh, I would say actually it is even a prestigious certification uh, for a product to achieve. Um, there, but there are different, definitely there are many other certifications, uh, certificating um, entities uh, around the world. In, in, uh, well, in Europe, they're different depending on the country as well. Um, each country usually has their own national certification. There is also, uh, generally in uh, European Union, there is an e eco label, EU eco label, which can be found on different um, products, uh, also even on the food, on, on, your, uh, on the food that you're buying in the grocery store or in your detergent. Um, and, uh, also, there is another one that is also worth to mention. It's a Nordics one. Uh, it is uh, another certification and uh, actually it's one of the most difficult to achieve. <laughs> really? I, we, did, we didn't apply for that, but, uh, uh, but uh, it's, it's something that I was reading. I was reading into that and it said it's, it is very difficult to achieve, the Nordics one. I do not know now. I don't know. I don't, I don't really know why. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's um, so basically certifications are a very good way to actually communicate if your product is uh, really um, environmentally friendly. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, I think the great thing about Cradle to Cradle is it's not only the environmental impact but also social impact because uh, the social uh, fairness 
is uh, really important when uh, when products are being developed, when the uh, products, uh, the, the supply chain, the the producers, if they are well treated, if the if they have fair um, uh, conditions for work. It is really important uh, to take into account that sustainability is not only focused on the environmental protection, it is also, it is also focused on um, social fairness. Totally, totally. Is ISO certification anywhere on the list for the furniture? Yes. Uh, for I I ISO, there is a... There is huge list of different types of certification uh, and um, there are actually different specification for different type of furniture whether it's domestic or not domestic and uh, the way you are actually um, work the, for, for the for the company there is uh, there are prestigious uh, oh let, let me let me Premium. remind yeah <laughs> let, let me remind them that um there, there's a important certification uh, in ISO that are really important for the companies that are striving for sustainability to achieve, which is uh, ISO 14,000, 14, uh, um, which is a quality assurance certification, and uh, ISO 14,006, which is eco-design um, certification that responds to um, whether your company the, the whole process of the development of uh, your services or products is environmentally and uh, socially um, responsible. Yeah, com compliant kind of. Well, I, I mean, and, yes, I'm <laughs> exactly, <learning>. and and <laughs> and, uh, and um, so th that's why I think when, whenever you, there is a company, there is an individual that is trying to produce something uh, or offer something that is uh, responding to environmental issues, to social issues, and also beneficial to, to the society, to, to the community, and also gives them opportunity to benefit from it. I think that's, that's the goal. Mm -hmm. But this is, at the moment, unfortunately, there's a lot of greenwashing. There's a lot of companies that are um, getting on into the bandwagon and trying to promote them as the uh, environmentally friendly products. But unfortunately, it's not true because if we try to dig deeper, uh, it's, there is a lack of transparency. Uh, and this is one of the important part of, uh, of uh, environmentally conscious, uh, like sustainably conscious, um, sustainability conscious company is the transparency and integrity for whatever they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I also think, like, I feel, and I see it in my own behavior, that people, people's trust will eventually completely shift towards the companies that are transparent, environmentally conscious, mm -hmm. socially compliant. I have a big event coming up and I'm already thinking, okay, I'm inviting my friends and family I'm not going to go to a restaurant that is just a restaurant. I'm really doing my research to go to the socially, uh, social enterprise-like restaurant, mm -hmm. something that is held by the veterans, something that is held by single mothers um, fund, let's say. And yeah, I'm really investing myself totally in that because I really prefer to support them rather than yet another big guy even though sometimes you know there is nothing bad with big guys they also have arrived there somehow but it still it feels much better especially in the times uh, of crisis absolutely to wrap up this big conversation i took tons of of notes uh, <laughs> design guide ellen MacArthur foundation and everything fairphone i will uh, add all the links um, uh, in the show notes. My pre last question the challenges that you see in the industry? Um, I think the, the most, the, the challenging thing is, is the, there is more and more companies that are actually taking this risk because eventually it's, it is a risk, but it's definitely worth to take it, to, take, to, to do this a step forward. And uh, 
from my perspective, I think there is a, a gap that is uh, in the process of uh, decreasing. It's uh, um, a collaboration between not only inside the industry, but the collaboration between academia and the government. And I think it, it, is, um, it is a model, it is a framework actually, because it's called the triple helix framework, which has been um, about 10 years ago, which has been uh, uh, developed to a quintuple innovation helix, uh, helix framework, um, where academia, industry, the government, public and the environment, environment they are all uh, taken into account uh, to address sustainable development uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is the framework, this is, this is a goal to, um, to achieve uh, more, to achieve more in, in a shorter time is actually to include all the stakeholders at the very early stage and to understand better the this, this situation, um, to understand it as more of a system rather than a single problem because eventually it is a more of a system problem rather than um, totally. individual one. How is it called again, the framework? Quintuple Innovation Helix Framework. Uh -huh. I, I, I will, don't worry, I will, I will send you the references. Okay, okay, I will add that. Um, I've collected a lot of additional resources to continue my own research. I hope the listeners will follow the lead. Is there one piece of advice that you would share with us? Or, you know, lots of books have been shared, the guidelines. Anything that maybe you are reading or watching a movie right now that you say, that's the hit, that's the bomb, that's something you should definitely uh, look into? Oh, I, did, I think I have a lot of reference to share with you. But uh, the most recent ones that I definitely recommend to watch, it has nothing to do with equity design, but it has everything to do with our uh, well-being. It's called H2O. Um, it is a documentary about uh, the superhero of the molecules, which is water, and how uh, this... Uh, how water is uh, important, is crucial for our existence, and uh, how it, everything is interconnected. It's, it is a PBS documentary. It, it has uh, three episodes, and definitely worth to watch it. Uh, also, I would definitely recommend for those who are in the field of design to watch a documentary done by Gutierrez Rosilier. Uh, it's called Ethics for Design. And uh, a very, uh, it's, it's a staple, it is a very important book for anyone uh, in, in, uh, involved in design to read, which is called uh, Design for the Real World by Viktor Papanek. Mm -hmm. I, I will be happy, I, I will send you all these all this references for easy access so you can share on your blog and yes. so, so listeners can, can uh, access it. Or have have it referenced, and I'm really hoping that I could uh, give some new information to those who listen to your podcast. And uh, myself, uh, I'm available. You, you can contact me for see if you, if you want to know more about this. I'm really looking forward to learn from both sides. I, eventually, uh, we always learn. It's, it's, it's a continuous uh, process. Totally. You definitely contributed a lot. I personally <laughs> learned a ton from you today, and I'm sure the listeners will, will do too. Thank you so much. I know I took a good hour of your time. I know that I have to let you go now to, to continue your work and your day. Uh, Aya, thanks a ton, first of all, to be proactive, to be, for, for being proactive, for contacting me, for reaching out to say, hey, hi, I listened to your podcast. Maybe we can collaborate in the future. Like, sure, let's do it right now. How about the, the episode? I've never done anything on furniture. Honestly, I didn't know anything about furniture and environmental design, sustainability design of, um, yeah, design, design for furniture or for anything else. Even though uh, I myself follow a lot of podcasts on architecture, urbanism uh, and design, yes. And uh, to share with you, one of my favorite YouTube shows uh, is called Never Too Small, about the apartments and how functional they are. 
20 square. It is a great, it is a great, a great channel. I also subscribe to it and I really enjoy see the ingenuity of, uh, of those who are behind of the, of the design of such spaces. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I myself am very into it, but I didn't know any of the things that you mentioned today. So huge thanks to you for your reactivity, proactiveness, uh, easy of, uh, you know, easiness of going um, and openness. I appreciate it and I really, uh, well, thanks to you to actually taking this step forward and, and invite me to participate. Uh, although um, I'm relatively new in the field, but I think it's definitely uh, worth to share these steps uh, to show others that are still learning or they're just beginning to see that it is what is possible, what is available out there and uh, to see, to show them the opportunities. Yeah, in 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 in, uh, in sustainability by design. Totally. Thanks so much. Ciao, Thank ciao. you, Anna.